here we are uh, in the second unit of this course, um, a unit on force and the forces that we exer observe in everyday life. If you've been following along, we have really been looking at motion and, and uh, the way it happens. Um, kind of how motion happens, describing motion. But really, we haven't stopped to ask um, perhaps why motion happens in the first place. And so that's the link between kinematics and dynamics, is that if kinematics explains how motion happens, dynamic addresses why motion happens. And um, for the rest of this unit, we're going to pay attention to the reasons behind motion um, and consider forces and different types of forces. And really what we're going to be looking at is based on um, the work of, of a young man named Sir Isaac Newton, um, who really was really not that much older than you when he started to develop some of these laws of physics. Um, and Newton's history is very interesting. Um, and it's certainly very rich. But here, here he is, uh, Sir Isaac Newton, in all of his glory. He really was just 18 years old when he started at Cambridge University. Um, and that's Cambridge University and, of course, the United Kingdom. And while he was a student, he came up with these three laws of motion. And the first law was basically, and, and s some people may have um, come across these before, that all objects will remain in a state of rest or will continue to move with a constant velocity unless acted on by an unbalanced force. So objects at rest stay at rest, objects in motion stay, at, stay in motion, unless they're acted on by unbalanced forces. His second law is that really the acceleration of an object depends inversely on its mass and directly on the unbalanced force applied to it. So if you want something to accelerate, um, that acceleration depends inversely on its mass. So the bigger the mass, the less acceleration an object will have. The smaller the mass, the greater acceleration an object will have. And it depends directly on the unbalanced force. So if you give an object a bigger force, it'll have a bigger acceleration. If you give it a smaller force, it'll have a smaller acceleration. All things that we've experienced in our day-to-day -day life. Newton's third law which is very, very uh, prevalent in popular culture, you, you've probably heard it for sure, is that for every action force, there's an equal and opposite reaction force. And, um, and we're going to talk about these three laws as we progress through the unit, and they become relevant. But before we jump ahead and get too far ahead of ourselves, um, we really should start thinking about what force means. And so what does force mean to you? And I've given you an indication about, you know, possibly what force means to me, uh, being a huge Star Wars fan. Um, of course, the force in Star Wars is this, of course, mythical um, energy field that permeates everything. And, of course, Jedi Masters and Sith Lords can control the force. But, of course, in real life you know, what is a force? And um, my students in the past, when, when I've asked this question in a class discussion, we have come up with a couple things. Force, a force is something that pushes another object. Um, equally as popular, a force is something that pulls another object. Right? So some students have drawn diagrams. And, of course, this student would be applying a force. This is kind of some of the things that we've talked about. This student that's pushing this huge crate is applying a force to the huge crate. Um, and really, really what it, <clears throat> what it comes down to, the end of the discussion, is really anything that causes motion to happen is a force. So a textbook definition, and this specifically comes from our textbook that we use in class, but... Really, any textbook definition is, is good, but our textbook defines a force as anything that produces, changes, or stops the motion of an object. And that's very general, and it's very straightforward, and really, it's a succinct way to talk about, um, you know, all these ideas that come out in classes. There's many different types of forces, okay, and, and we see them all over the place. A couple... Uh, that we're going to talk about specifically 
or the gravitational force. Absolutely. Um, gravity is, is a force that we're going to learn in this unit. The electric force and closely related to that, the magnetic force. And if you think about, oh, there's an electric force, there's a magnetic force, of course there is. And these are things that you've probably experienced. You know, in grade 9 science and in grade 10 science and even earlier in, in intermediate level science, you know, we talk about a, a proton and an electron and how they repel each other. Well, what is that repulsion? Well, that's the, the electric force. Um, the magnetic force you've certainly experienced. How can a magnet that's sitting on your fridge defy gravity? Well, it's because the magnetic force is acting to keep that magnet stuck to uh, the refrigerator and, and it doesn't slip. It doesn't fall under the influence of gravity. Um, also, something that we'll discuss in this course a little bit later on, in, in very general ways, is the nuclear force. And um, there's different types of the nuclear force, but we're, we're not going to get into that kind of detail. But really, the nuclear force talks about um, atoms, and it talks about why, if you've got all these protons that are stuck together in the nucleus of an atom, why would those protons stay in the nucleus? Protons experience an electric force of repulsion, you know, so why why would those protons stay so close in a nucleus? And the answer, of course, has to do with the nuclear force. And that's something that we'll talk about very briefly, um, but in much greater detail in, in grade 12 physics. Certainly friction is a, the type of force that we, is a type of force that we experience every single day, and we'll talk about that this unit and something that we'll talk about, the centripetal force, is the force of objects when they're moving in um, circular trajectories or, or curved trajectories, and the centripetal force is um, something that's investigated later on. Um, forces can either be contact forces or non-contact forces. Okay, so um, forces don't have to, th objects don't necessarily have to be touching in order to have uh, forces acting on them. Um, certainly a book that's in contact with a table is experienced a contract force because that book is being supported by the table and so the, the, the book exerts a force on the table because um, the book is not falling. It doesn't fall through the table. It experiences a supportive force from the table. Whereas, say, two magnets attract each other and you can feel that attraction as you hold those magnets in your hand and there's no contact between them. Those magnets just attract. So. <clears throat> this would be an example of a contact force and a non-contact force here. So according to your definition of what force means to you, and looking at the definition of force that we get from the textbook, let's take a look at the following examples and see, okay, is there a force acting in these situations. So here's a person and they're trying to move a stalled car. However, the stalled car is not moving. So is there a force that's acting on the car? We would say yes, of course there's forces acting. So what are some of those forces? Well, you may have said, so we're talking about only the force, forces that are acting on the car. So, well, gravity's acting. Gravity's acting to keep the car stuck to the ground. The person is pushing the car. It's not moving, but the person's still pushing it. That's a force that's acting on the car. Friction is acting, and that's probably what's keeping the car in place. And maybe there's some internal forces. Maybe the brakes are applied. Maybe the transmission is in park. And of course, that's why the car is not moving. So maybe there's some internal forces. Well, here's a couple other examples. The bicycle and a rider are shown here. They're on a flat road, okay? There's no pedaling, there's no braking, but they're slowing down. The bicycle's slowing down. So the bike, the rider, they're just coasting, casually slowing down, no pedaling, no braking. Is there a force on the bicycle? We should say, sure, yeah, there's, there's lots of forces that are acting on the bicycle, and a couple of them could be. Gravity is acting on the bicycle, of course, yeah. The cyclist, you know, is, is actually adding a force on the bicycle because the cyclist is 
has mass. And so because the cyclist is also being pulled down, it's, the cyclist is providing a force to the bike. Friction is probably acting between the tires and the road. And we could even say air resistance. And air resistance isn't something we're going to talk about in great detail, but we could say, yeah, yeah, yeah. There would be, there would be air resistance that was acting on that bicycle. A golf ball flies through the air after being struck by the golf club. Is there a force on the golf ball? So here it is. It's flying through the air. There's nothing touching it. Is there a force on it? And of course you'd say, well, this is a projectile. And a projectile falls under the influence of gravity. So, yeah, we would say for sure gravity's acting on the golf ball because it's eventually going to fall back down to the ground. Right? There's also air resistance. Most of the time in our calculations, we exclude air resistance, but it's there. It's acting. Is there any other force that's causing this ball to keep on going? And a lot of people are very often say, well, yeah, it's traveling through the air, so there must be some, like, force that's causing the motion. Well... In this case, no, there's really not. The only two forces that are acting in this case are gravity and air resistance. And that's a very common misconception is that as this object flies through the air, there must be some force keeping it going. But there's not a force keeping it going. It was given an initial velocity, and now it's a projectile. Here a policeman is moving a demonstrator. Is there a force on the demonstrator? And hopefully you've seen the pattern Yes, of course, there's a force in the demonstrator. Gravity's acting to keep the demonstrator strongly rooted to the ground. The policeman is actually pulling the demonstrator. Maybe if the demonstrator's dragging his feet or doing something, there would be friction that would be acting. But I think you get the idea. that We can analyze a whole bunch of situations and say, hey, is there forces that are acting on these things? Newton's first law to visit this specifically states that objects at rest will remain in a state of rest, and objects in motion will remain in a state of motion. And by motion, I mean constant velocity or uniform motion, unless they're acted on by an unbalanced force. Okay. This law describes two possible conditions if an object is left alone. It either stays put or it continues to move in uniform motion at a constant velocity. And this property is known as inertia. Right? Inertia is kind of defined as the ability of an object to resist changing its motion. And the object's mass is a measure of this property. So we've all seen um, the trick of basically a very nice tablecloth with a beautiful place setting and very expensive china and you know, very expensive um, dinnerware, and, you know, a magician will take the tablecloth and move it very, very fast, and everything will just stay on the table. And, you know, why is that an example of Newton's first law? Um, well, to, to put it quite plainly, is that the objects that are on the tablecloth, yes, they certainly do experience... Um, a small force from the tablecloth because there would be friction involved there. But because that force isn't large enough, the objects kind of stay where they are. There isn't enough force to overcome their inertia. And so the inertia that they experience, which is basically all those things on the top of the table, are at rest. They will continue at rest because they, their mass is too much um, to be overcome and actually start moving. Um, because of the friction of the tablecloth, it's just whoosh, pulled out really, really quickly, and those objects stay at rest. Um, another thing that you may have experienced is certainly um, when you're in the car and you come to a stop. And, of course, what do you do when you come to a stop, especially if it's a hard stop? Everyone in the car kind of moves forward. And that's the, that's the, um, the tendency of objects that are in motion or, or undergoing uniform motion to want to continue doing what they're doing. 
and the car is actually providing you know an unbalanced force to slow you down and so that's why we move forward it's because we were moving forward in the first place we applied the brakes to slow down and of course our bodies want to continue in motion but we don't continue in motion because we're being acted on by this unbalanced force and that's you know either friction or that's you know the car acting on us so those are kind of examples of the introduction of forces and Newton's first law and um, we're going to investigate more of Newton's laws in the next lesson.